started. Um, the thing that was kind of like semi-started already just so that it could be a bigger painting and you could get a feel for you know what a larger work looks like rather than a small one. Um, so you can see here I've I've gone in and I've done all of my uh, outlines, the cloisonism outlines, which are sort of black, done them all in black paint very carefully. It took a long time. There was a lot of design. Gradually, at the, um, my other element on the table flipped over, and I just realized compositionally it was stronger to do that. So I just very quickly in Photoshop moved it over as I was done. So you can all keep me right. The light's coming from over here, going this way. If you see me going awry there, please let me know. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I haven't, this still, I know going around the room with that. There's also a color plan. I like to um, early on really design what colors I'm doing, what, how I'm changing the painting, what, or the photograph to become my painting. And I really like to do all of those, that thinking up front so that when I get to this stage, I can just sort of paint and not worry about what color was this gonna be or what was I, was I moving that flower over here or this element on the table. And so it's doing as much of that thinking up front. And those who are taking my workshop over the next few days will go through all of those steps and we'll talk about the whys and wherefores. But I, I often say it's like, um, you know, it's sort of the, the building a house sort of analogy that if you build a really strong and good foundation, in other words, we do lots of thinking and planning beforehand, hopefully our house will be a bit straighter and stay up for a bit longer. Um, so that's the idea. Uh, so I, I think because I haven't got the source material and I'll, I'll start with something that should be fairly straightforward. So I'm gonna start doing these um, clementines or tangerines or whatever they are, um, just because that's a, a pretty good place to start. I'll, um, through the course of the evening, do a lot of uh, squeezing tubes of paint, acrylic paint out and scraping them away again um, because I'm gonna move around through a variety of colors and I'll need the space on my palette and also, as many of you know, acrylic paint dries pretty quickly. Um, and apologies if I um, am blocking someone. I think I'll, I'll try and remember and move my body position around quite a lot. But if I seem to have been stuck in one, one place for a long time, maybe let me know and I'll change that too. I'm not going to list every color I squeeze out unless you're desperate to know. And do feel free to ask. Just shout stuff out if you, uh, if you need it. So yeah, so, well, so um, the planning, uh, sketching side takes me a while. That's a, sort of a few hours of thinking and doodling sometimes. I don't know if this was quite a few hours. But then that line work is definitely a few hours just doing those black outlines. And then the color plan itself, I generally sort of work out what colors I'm gonna put within the painting in probably in about an hour of doing that. And then the underpainting is quite quick. And so in some of this is I've begun to paint on a, you know, the, the, the second layer, the upper layer, if you like. But all of this is, is underpainting around here. And that's pretty quick to do, um, 30 minutes, maybe an hour. So, so we're sort of like, maybe we're, we're, just, we're under a day in, but we're, we're not, a, not um, but in real time, it was probably sp spread over a little bit of time. Um, and the next stage, the stage I'm doing tonight, is actually, the, if I don't stop talking and start painting, is quite a quick stage. Um, and then that finally tuning it near the end, where I adjust colors and I refine some parts of things, that's actually quite a labor-intensive stage again. Um, but hopefully this is the fast and, and quick um, and I'm very, I'm interested in the final, I'm a sort of an artist who's not interested in obviously reality. I'm looking for a dramatic painting. I'm looking for a painting that stands up in its own right that you could kind of judge and appreciate on its, for its own merits. I'm not worried in about photographic accuracy. Uh, I'm not even, I'm just interested in suggesting these elements in the most sort of romantic and pleasing way we can possibly. Um, so, uh, in the case here, of, I started mixing my colors for my um, citrus fruit. And I don't mind, you know, if the colors here are slightly redder or slightly darker. I just want something that anyone can look at and go, that's a tangerine, you know. And that's what I'm striving for, really. Um, the, the broad strokes in identifiability as well as hopefully some broad strokes, too. 
I want, I want the art to look like it's, you know, very much um, a la prima, sort of painted in the moment, even if it has taken me several weeks to create. Um, so. so did anyone looking at that get confused by what they saw? Did, is there any questions from, from this, or was that all straight? That obvious? Just, the, you added the chair, and I assume it looked like on the left hand, I don't have oh the yeah, on, there's a chair. Like some, uh, so there's a very so in the original photographic reference there is a there is a chair there. Okay. Um, it's it's just it's a slightly different chair. I made the um, the chair was brown and obviously I think it's a more compelling painting. The way if it's blue, it's going to react more with colors within there. It's going to balance a little more. Um, brown is a little boring basically in, in within the context of the painting design I've got. Um, I've widened the, this so it's become a little more of a centerpiece or a little more obvious. It was too thin before and that felt, it's actually a small chair, I don't know, it's not a child's chair but it's like a three-quarter <laughs> chair and I wanted that that bigger so I, um, I fattened it up a little bit and you can see that's what the white line is. I originally painted closer to what it really was and then I thought no it's going to look better if, um, if I adjust that. I do now. So traditionally, I used to. Do, I've, I've always done a color plan. I, my background was sort of in film, television, sorts of things, and then I moved into kind of animation-related work. And within both of those industries, you're often sort of prototyping things. And we would do, you know, you do storyboards, you do little color designs, and sometimes you do these little sort of mood sketches for colors you might want to include. And originally, when I started painting, I would often produce little pastel thumbnails effectively which was sort of again a me comes a bit from the media side of things but I do one or two pastels and I'd go not those colors not that color well maybe half of that and that and I'm done and then move on and the nice thing about using a computer in that process and I will cover this in, de in detail in the workshop is that you can make changes like that really fast and really accurately and indeed this is just a printout but the accuracy I have of the colors on say an iPad which I normally work with beside are so much sort of closer to what I'm trying to achieve and they're so easy to adjust if I want to try out something else. So, so now, yes, I always try to do that. What um, programs do you use on your iPad? I use Procreate more than anything because um, Procreate is, is a really nice package for speed of use um, uh, and all I'm interested again is speed, choice of colors, fast response, that kind of thing. Another good one is possibly Art Rage, which very much emulates art tools, but it's not always fast and um, it gives you a lot, a lot of other issues to deal with. And the nice thing about Procreate is, is sort of its speed and flexibility. And I do within the workshop, if you're part of that, I do do a little breakout class for people interested in that side of it and I'll, we'll do a little, I'll exp I can demo it and talk about why I do it one way and that kind of thing. Um, okay. So I'll also probably jump around the canvas a little more than I normally would um, just to try and get, get you sort of a greater feeling of the whole painting as we go. Um, then, you know, normally I'd be a little more systematic working through the, all of the oranges across the whole painting and, you know, whereas here we'll jump jump through different colors and we'll stop and go off and do other things. Um, moving a bit for I'm going to try over here for a bit it's slightly harder though than no I can't do that don't worry there'll be things there'll be things on the other side of the, the canvas soon <laughs> okay. I use a lot of filbert brushes um, I used to be quite sort of I suppose disciplined in what kind of brush I would use I was and uh, uh, like many artists, anti-round brushes 
um, always encouraging students to use a large brush, you know, all of these sorts of things. And I, I find that more and more over the years I break so many of the rules myself that I find that I'm less disciplined in these things. So I, I might just, you know, if I have students, I'll encourage them to do, do certain things, but I'm aware that, that I, like I will nowadays paint an awful lot with round brushes. Uh, I just, the, the way I hold a brush is, um, you know, even with a round brush, you don't tend to necessarily get round strokes, so that's not so bad. Probably I'm going a bit slowly, really. It's that talking and painting thing I told you about. It's much faster if I just concentrate on. But there's a fully loaded brush. Um, I, so again, um, a lot, some of my background was, was, I would say I was a bad watercolorist. And in watercolor, you're always, you know, only mixing sort of one or two colors together to get a really pure, crisp color. Um, and I, I really carry that through into you know, my, definitely my acrylic painting, and to some degree my oil painting too. Um, though if I do a lot of oil painting, I start to forget. But it, it's a, it's a, you'll notice that for the most part, I'm keeping colors pretty pure and crisp just because of that, those sorts of decisions. Um, and a lot of that is from that, for lack of a better term, we'll call it watercolor training. But um, Oh, I'm forgetting about tangerine over at the far side here too, which is in the sun. This is in danger of looking like a mini pumpkin. <laughs> we'll hopefully fix that before the paint when the painting's done. You know. So I haven't. You may have noticed already. I haven't been looking terribly closely at generally when I look over here I'm doing checking both but but it but invariably I'm more interested in what my color plan looks like than the original photographic source and that changes when I do something that I'm I really want to get right like whether it's sort of flower foliage or some real detail orientated thing but if I am just suggesting say a tablecloth and I've already marked out where that tablecloth is going to go I'm more interested, as I say, in getting these sort of colors feeling right and that kind of thing than, than I am in, um, uh, in precise accuracy. And so the color plan is always where I'm going to to get those color relationships rather than um, did I put it in exactly the right place? Did I shade the light just perfectly over there? I mean, my generalistic comment about make sure I get the shadows in the right place is is sort of consistent with it, like because I'm, you know, that that where that where the shadow is falling, as long as it feels right, uh, you know, I'm good with that as a as a strategy. Um, yeah. So for the moment, that'll do. I I like to think that I'll explore, won't re-explore areas when I paint them to try and keep their freshness and the luster and things. But invariably, I do come back and do adjustments. I'll come back later on. Like I would often sort of stop at about that point. And, um, but then I'll come back and add a little more detail to those tangerines. Um, and uh, yeah, you see that's going to, um, and I'll, I'll come back and I'll improve what needs to be done tonally or whatever. Um, obviously, there's a lot of detail work still to go into them, and that's when they really start to read well as, as, as elements. But um, that's... Do you ever go back, how often do you go back in and redefine the outlines, you know, the darker outlines of, of um, fruit? So I'll always do that. I'll do that once in a painting, and I do that sort of in the l late, late stages. And it does need to happen because lines get lost, um, you know, the edge of that tangerine there. I want to redefine that, for example. Um, the, the trick is to get it, get the balance right. You want a variable line widths and strengths to keep it a compelling painting so it's not too rigid. Um, 
and you so you want to make sure when you go back you don't do it everywhere you just sort of you just sort of make it lost and found come and go um, and actually that that the buzzword lost and found is something else that's very indicative and unusual in my work and most artists are um, hanging their hat on on that idea of sort of there being a focal point and there being other areas in the the, the painting that are more ambiguous and where there's darker shadows and things are just floating off into the, the dark, say, and you can't quite see all the detail. What's unusual in my work is everything is on show. And what that basically means is you need to have really strong composition and a really good colours design so that the painting holds together and still looks like a good painting because you don't have that extra crutch, which is a vital one for many artists, of having the ambiguity of softer areas. You know, and I do it. A there'll be a little bit, you know, in here, in the shadows within the foliage, for example. You're gonna, there's gonna be less to see, um, but it's still, it's still readable. There's still definition in there um, compared to, you know, usual paintings. So it's a bit of a balancing act. Yeah. When you make your uh, initial drawing with the black line. Yeah. Yeah, I'm painting it. I'll draw. I'll draw with a. Um, often I'll use uh, because I'm. If it, I'll use a watercolor pencil, okay. and I'll draw. I'll draw on the if it's something that needs to be careful. Um, and I'll, I'll, sometimes those lines are kind of messy, but sometimes they're very careful. And then I'll I'll go in and I'll paint in those lines. And then when those that painted outline is dry, I will then um, wash away the watercolor pencil. Um, and then if, if I wish, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of extra nuance to seeing some lines underneath there. But um, so I'm it's pretty careful drawing. That's quite a time consuming. That's why um, process is the uh, the um, act of just drawing all of those outlines on the whole thing it takes a long time. OK, so then so now I'm uh, going to go in and find some of those lighter tones on the tablecloth. Um, which I'll try and do from over here for a bit because we'll get some people on the other side of the room a better view for a while. Um, and I'll be picking up a lot of that orange that I had in those tangerines so that there's sort of color changes as you go along. Um, This uh, easel does, as Rich was telling me, wobble an awful lot with this size of canvas. But, you know, it's okay. Could be worse. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So the underpainting for me is an important part of the painting. I, I um, forever tell people it's lazy pointillism. It's the idea that I'm often with the underpainting using colors that are going to vibrate and react with what colors come on top. So there'll quite often be a, you know, like a complementary, like a green underneath the red or vice versa. And that way I'll intentionally leave little spaces in the final painting where that underpainting will just shine through um, and create a sort of reaction and a bit of vibrance between the two things. Uh, you know, Walter Sickett used to do a lot of that, um, but with probably more elegance. And um, I, I probably achieve it slightly more lazily. But um, the end was that's the that's the idea to the underpainting is I'm looking for things that are going to create reactions with the paint that's going to go ultimately on top. And acrylic is a great medium for layering paint. Um, with oil, I do need to be more careful about what my color mixes are and what colors I put underneath and that kind of thing. Even with acrylic, I do need to make sure it's, you know, if it's a transparent like the, you know, say the yellow on a lemon, I won't be putting any strong color underneath there. Um, so, there's, so there's certainly thought to the underpainting about what you're going to be putting on top. Um, but the idea behind it is this, I, looking for reaction and sometimes looking for tonal pushes. So, you know, in areas of shadow, I will sometimes put a richer blue in the underpainting, and that already is going to push that top color down um, a few notches, so it'll be darker. Um, the 
fairly wobbly. Uh, but that's great on, inter on the internet with people with slow refresh speed. Could be all. tricky thing about stretching into these is, is getting interesting brush strokes. I'm getting very similar brush strokes every time and normally I think that's something I would um, wouldn't do quite so much. I think it's because I'm continually stretching across. They, they're a little, they're coming in a little too similar and that's well certainly it's something I'm thinking about as I'm going along but I'm not necessarily managing to get them quite as good as they are. Um, and then also, the, the, the might be obvious to a lot of you, I'm, I'm a huge uh, proponent of negative shape cutting over positive shape. So, you know, the example of that, if you paint a tree, do you paint the sky and then do the foliage of the tree as positive shapes? Um, or are you painting the foliage and then cutting into the foliage with the sky? And that's negative shape cutting. And then the defining shapes with the negative for me is is always more compelling and it's a, it's a weird thing because really they should end up looking the same but for some reason they never do and um, uh, I just think that 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 I, I just adore this sort of negative pushing so I'm so I have maybe sometimes these thick outlines and I'm cutting in there and then often I'll here I am cutting into the shadows a little bit um, on the tablecloth and so I'm always sort of pushing those, those two, two of the notes. Only at this point I realise I have no idea what time it is. So, do you let me know when you just okay, or just let me know when you all get bored, which you know. <laughs> at what time do you start? I don't know actually. See, I just started. <laughs> when I collapse. <laughs> I, I, there's very little difference between my oils and acrylics, the final results. I think any, to any kind of, anyone vaguely aware they can tell, but only just. And I think many people buy them and have no care or knowledge of which they are. Um, and I, I'll do, invariably I'll generally do my oils with acrylic underpainting. So at the stage of underpainting will be when I'll switch to oil, because that makes it so much faster and easier. But it's not essential. I mean, I have done oils from start to finish. It's just you have to wait for those other stages to dry before you can um, go. I mean, you know, the, the, the thing is, an if you're painting with acrylic you, and you're really an oil painter, the thing you miss is glazing and that all of those nuances. But, it, you know, um, there are, I, I think there's lots of lovely things about acrylic paint too, you know, they're just different, right? They, they're... Um, it's uh, got to embrace embrace all the differences. Um, I could do with backing up for a moment because I can't tell what I'm doing now. Oh yeah, okay. That's what I've been doing. <laughs> so you can paint oils on top of acrylic, but not acrylic on top of oils. Yeah. Yeah, and but you can try that if you like, and you'll see why. Because <laughs> it doesn't stick well. Well, what if the acrylic is a juice? 
It doesn't separate? Doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't, it really doesn't, yeah. It's a sort of, you soon, you soon realize, hang on, something's not right. Yeah, they're speaking from experience. <laughs> okay, I need to come over here for a bit again, sorry. This is obviously when I do detail. I've got to come over here. Careful brush strokes. You might think it's bad because you keep not being able to see, but you can appreciate that, that I'm doing all the best work, really, blocking your view. <laughs> With the same brush. Yeah. With the same brush, yeah. Using it in different ways, though, whoever said that. Misty voice out there. Yeah, I mean, I'm... You know, there's a lot of this, but then I'm also, and that's why I, I'm a big fan of holding your brush like this, because you get a lot, you get a more variety of stroke. And I'm using a, a flat brush, which when we were talking about brushes earlier, I used to do an awful lot of painting with a flat brush, and I hardly ever use one now. So I, you know, but I guess I wasn't really checking when I was packing my bag. So here's a flat brush. Um, then, you know, you go through phases on these things. People ask what your favorite brush is. What my favorite brush a few years ago was probably different from what I'm using now and so on and so forth. I think it's just a partly what you got used to for a while. Um, so is that a hog bristle? Or? Yeah, I do like hog bristles. Mm -hmm. And I do occasionally have synthetic brushes kicking around, but they're not, they're not, I don't found ones that I like. Yeah, I'm a b big fan of hog hair brushes or similar. I'll leave it like that. So when you say similar, does that mean synthetic <laughs> that are kind of like that? I probably mean other bristle related brushes. Okay. So um, I, I, I'm fully, w fully believe that there probably are synthetics out there that are quite nice to use. Um, I don't use, a, use them a lot myself. That doesn't mean, you know, I'm against them. And it doesn't mean that occasionally we'll find one. You know, I do, I'm a bit, you know, certain people end up with too much stuff. I have too many brushes. I'm always, every time I do a paint order, I order brushes and I, and I use brushes till they're absolutely a stub. And so I don't need that many brushes. I gradually get more and more brushes. And then I go, I like to say you have a favorite brush and that goes out of fashion. So, so those, you know, I just, I'm, they, I have old brushes that I used to like that I don't like anymore that are still in there. And I'm waiting for that to come back into fashion in my <laughs> tastes, to, you know. Um, so I wouldn't mind, do you have a paper towel? Because that's yet another thing I forgot to bring with me. Sorry. I, it's partly because I keep painting myself. <laughs> yeah. Well. I'm sure it'll it'll be useful other times too. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. All right. So that was probably more of the tablecloth than I planned to do, but it gives you a feel for it. And, and you know, the if you're if you're not talking too much and thinking right, you want to leave these little bits of underpainting to shine through the blues and the yellows. You can see them clearly across here. There's probably too many of them. And it's a little unfinished, the tablecloth. But one of the risks is if you do too much, they'll, they, you, you then paint them away and you can't get them back, right? So the idea is to bring it so far and then stop at the right time so that you haven't lost that um, little bit of underpainting that you wished you'd kept. Uh, those bits just sort of bug me. But, uh, maybe, okay, maybe that bit bugs me too. And then you can sort of just generally say, oh, we'll fix that later. Um, so what's next? Maybe the, uh, the vase or the table. I'll take votes on what's next. <laughs> vase. Vase. Okay, vase. I'm, I can be bought, you know, with my told what to do. Okay, so some purples. I um maybe some violets. This is quite good because it's in the same sort of ranges. Uh 
and I'll bet you get that brush. So that's a round brush that I've, I use a lot of these ones now. Um, it's quite, they wear down pretty quickly, these ones, for some reason, but they are, I just like them. That's why I'm just going to leave it at that. I just like them. That's, that's as much as I can tell you. There's no science to it. Uh, I'll probably, you know, I, I do too, with acrylic, you is, is really kind of hopeless at glazing, but I will sometimes glaze certain things, um, and especially small elements, and I could see that this jug may well be something that I would glaze. Like, I'll get it tonally in the right direction, and then I'll just, um, near the, in those final stages, do a little bit of glazing. Now, you'll have noticed if you studied that color plan, a lot of elements in it were very messily colored in. Um, and sometimes I, I think there's a lot of beauty in that mess. You know, the, the, the top of this, this jug here I left as a red band and it's sort of ready orange in the top. And that's kind of strange. And there's none of the, the um, jug patterning visible in it. And the question of whether I go... Uh, more like the color plan or more like the original painting, I've still sort of left up to my interpretation as I paint. So I will, so I suppose what I'm saying is, I, you, you may have already worked this out for yourself. I'm not following anything closely, um, but I am sort of letting myself be um, steered by it as I go. And sometimes I'll, I, I, you know, this, this idea of revisiting areas, I try not to, but sometimes I'll make one of those decisions and it'll be the wrong one and then I'll try and revert or go back or, you know, um, maybe just rethink would be a politer way of saying it. Um, so I think I'm going to get rid of that nice red and orange up top, but I could see possibly um, putting in a little bit of the patterning, but in a red and orange color later on might be quite a nice thing to do. Um, so that's where my head is now whether when I revisit that later um, I'll be thinking the same, I don't know. So I suppose it's you, the simple way to say that is I'm letting the painting speak to me. That's a very pretentious statement for you there. Um, I want it to be a little, probably a little bit cooler. Um, we've got a, a very sort of purple to red table a a lot of reds on the tablecloth and the elements on there. So having this a little bit cooler is a good thing as far as I'm concerned, um, giving us a degree of separation. I'm forever sort of remixing um, as I work to sometimes fix mistakes, but sometimes to find the color I've lost. You know, the advantage of oil, obviously, is you can keep keep your colors. Um, with acrylic, you really get good at mixing because you're, you're always needing to remix. Um, and uh, for, for if, you're, if you're unfamiliar with acrylic, you know, it really does dry to a different brightness. Uh, once you paint. Lighter or darker? Darker. It goes darker. Yeah. It's annoying. But again, you do, I mean, over time you get used to it. But it's still annoying. They could have fixed that, couldn't they? <laughs> For me. Okay. Something like that. How's that looking? A little messy, but it's okay. So yeah, and sort of, um, you know, the original photograph. There's not a lot of shading on there, and you know, actually, the jug was part of the thing that flipped. So the light source is all in the wrong place, right? So I've moved the light source, and I did it right today. You know, it's coming from over here, um, but there's a lot of sort of interpretation. I think it's probably nicer if there's some sort of shading that runs up the, the heart of the vessel because usually if you're looking at a shadow and it's coming from it's coming from over here but it's also wrapping around this that ultimately we're probably looking for something that's 
you know, coming through the middle. Um, and I'll probably do a little bit of tidying up of this. It's, I, I claim that at this point, you know, because you're all you're thinking it's messy. Uh, but then if I choose not to, go back. Yeah, so that's probably actually darker than I think about it. Something like that. Um, and re-establishing some of those outlines later on is what will really like crisp it up too. The moment, it, the moment I kind of come through and I put a heavier line down the middle, that'll seem like a, a more carefully rendered uh, jug than it actually is. Well, so the traditional, uh, the tradition is um, uh, like, you know, in the, in the Impressionist era, post-Impressionist era, you know, Gauguin uh, was, was really one of the fathers of it, but Van Gogh and all these people, they were in Paris and they went to um, uh, an exhibition uh, on Japanese woodblock printing. And, you know, obviously in that era, that was the first they'd ever seen of this type of art. And they were all quite inspired by that. And they tried to emulate it within their painting. And so they used generally like a, a blue, like an ultramarine blue and things, and were doing that sort of outlining. And it had that French term cloisonism, cloison A, which I don't speak French, but it's like stained glass window type of stuff, right? And that's the infancy of this stylistic aesthetic choice, right? And I, I like it. I've always liked it as an aesthetic. As a kid, I like cartoons. They have outlines. You know, it's, a, it's something that I've always enjoyed, and it creates an awful lot of impact. And um, it's something that works for me very well in my still life painting. And, it, it, and I find within my landscape, it, so, it sort of works. Like, I, I, you know, I struggle a little more in the landscape because I think it is a very powerful thing to do. And I'm looking sometimes in landscape for a little more sort of nuance and a little more subtlety. So, you do know. Do you typically do that or, or break it? Break so the lines are different. piece of subject like, like the vase? Do you, so the lines are something different again. So the lines for me are, you know, they're not cubism because the infancy of cubism was a sort of a, an attack on the impressionist. It was a breaking away from this. It was looking for monochromatic primarily and showing the same object from multiple different angles and facets and that kind of thing. And for me, all I'm looking for is, I describe it as a little intellectual stimulus for the eye. So I paint very traditional, straightforward, still life paintings and they're, um, they're to be appreciated and enjoyed, um, but they are familiar to us. And I'm looking for ways to just sort of elevate that a little bit. And the moment you take a one of these lines and you start dissecting the work just a little bit, it creates that just an extra level of nuance and interest to it, and it becomes a more compelling painting in my mind. And it's something that works well, I think, for still my still lifes, but I don't often do it in my landscape because it, in the landscape it feels intrusive it feels a bit like putting up a, you know, a, a skyscraper in the middle of a field to me sometimes, you know. Um, whereas, uh, you know, fr fruit and fruit and veg are fine to be chopped up and thrown around. Um, so that's kind of the, the element. It's, it's, it's. I mean, it's definitely it's an illustrative effect. It's a, it's a breaking of the boundaries, um, but it's, it's a, it, for me, I find it compelling. Um, and no one else is really doing it quite in the way that I do that. It's definitely a, a sort of a, a, no one's stupid enough, I suppose, or it's a, it's a signature thing um, that I do. Yeah. That's what I meant. That's say. what you meant, yeah. Yes, thank you for asking <laughs> a different way. Oh, I, I just could talk about both. Uh, somebody would have wanted to know the other one. <laughs> Yeah, and there's a, we'll cover, in, it, for those attending the workshop, if you're interested in trying out the lines and experimenting, well, I'll talk about those and there's, you know, there's a lot of rules that I have learned the hard way about where you can put a line and where you can't. If you place it in the wrong place, it'll, it'll give the, the, um, a very unsettling feeling. If you give the line basically a third dimension so it feels like you could walk around it, it's quite an unsettling thing. Um, and to get that balance just right is sometimes uh, difficult. 
took years to master. Years. Okay, so uh, something like let. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've explained it all. There's no question. <laughs> I have nothing else to say. <laughs> Anyone know any good jokes? Apart from, you know, my painting. I'm spending too long over there, aren't I? So, how many layers will you paint in acrylic? So, yeah, in my ideal world, I do my, you know, my original outlines, my underpainting, and then my painting on top. And my painting on top, I, I'll just do once. But in reality, I'll go back and I'll change um, details. Like, for example, I'll realize that maybe I think this might be a bit dark. Right, looking at it now, and so I'll go back and I might redo sections of that vase, maybe jug, maybe most of it, right? And so there, you could say on the jug, there's been an, yet another layer, um, and that'll that process will carry on. You won't, you really won't try and do sort of multiple multiple layers, because um, it'll end up being quite dead if you do. So I'm looking to do as few as possible, um, and then there's definitely this tidy up stage. So even though I would regard it as, you know, the underpainting, basically, and an upper layer. Um, and then there's the tidy up is adding little details, and it's probably another layer in places, but not everywhere. Um, that's what I'm striving for. And, and so the outline that you were talking about? The outline I'm not counting. I'm counting that as underpainting or, okay. or overpainting, either, but I'm not counting it as a whole separate layer of paint because it's not everywhere. You know. So the spots of the pink and the blue and the orange that you had in the background, you just do those for like Well they were orange? they were kind of everywhere. Uh -huh. Although there was some yellow too. This so this is underpainting. But this in here uh, was some overpainting that I just sort of did to get a feel for how those colours were sitting. And this is so this is a new layer. And you can see some of the blue through there, right? And in places, I'll go again with another layer to push that down more. Um, and in other places, other areas, it'll look quite nice. Because I want some, you know, the, the original photograph, again, is this drape. And I've sort of changed the positioning of the drape a little bit. I'm not interested in necessarily showing fabric folds in this painting. I'm looking for more color because there's a lot going on here. So I don't really want people to spend a lot of time in that background. So I'm looking for something that isn't too interesting. And yet I want it to be quite dynamic. So even in my color plan, I've done a little sort of very light pale whitish hues up there and a bit of color. And I will keep that idea. So I'll probably have some passage of light. But I'm not going to say this is fabric. Look at the folds, you know. Um, and it's that getting that balance right. Um, I could do a bit of yellow now and just remove some of those other areas. Um, why not? Why not? Why not? So do you go to the market a lot to buy fruit? So I, the way I tend to work um, is I, I do do that, and, and I will buy, you know, everything that looks good. I don't worry about the budget, you know. And I will also buy a, lots of different bouquets of flowers and things. And then I will spend a very long day moving uh, furniture around in my home to get all the different tables and to get all the bowls and all the jugs. And I have wardrobes full of spare vases and things and my favorite jugs that appear in many paintings and get it all together. And then I will photograph them in different arrangements. 
and I'll take a lot of photos and a lot of different arrangements. And then from that, I'll only ever paint a handful of them um, because I'll always do a setup that either is too close to the best one or um, isn't good enough. You know, so there's a lot that just don't get done because of those two criteria. Um, and then there's obviously a handful of ones that are just right and they get painted. Uh, but more and more, I'll now composite from previous photographs. So I'll take the bouquet from that photo shoot and the table from this one, stick them together in my mind and end up with that. And I'll do that a lot. Of, and, or even uh, I'll take bouquets I often work from photographic reference, but more and more elements on the table I will create sometimes from my mind, you know. Because by now I've done so many lemons, I can really draw a lemon and paint a lemon to my standard <laughs> without, um, without needing a reference material. And I do follow those rote, you know, it's, for me it's about re-establishing that imagery. So I'm not, again, not interested in the photographic realism or getting the light just right, that's not what my art's about. So the idea that I am plucking that out of my head and going, well, I know the shadow's here and I know that's roughly right, that's fine because that's... The, the, you know, my, my objective is not to, to be, you know, photographically representing something. My, my objective is to have a nice painting at the end of the day, you know, or a powerful painting or a fun painting or whatever. Insert your own adjective here, you know. Um, I'm biased. You know. I tend to think of my, I'm, I tend to think that the color I put in and the way I structure my still lifes is, I'm all, all about creating a powerful painting. I think still lifes, you know, an important medium, and you can create, you know, a really exciting, powerful, strong painting from that. And most people, when they look at them, they go, oh, they're so happy, and they're so colorful, and they're, you know, they sort of respond to it as a, um, a, a sort of a, a, a joyous, light-hearted way. But for me, there's some, some, some sort of sort of more somber power is behind the, the, the ethos. It doesn't matter, the end, as long as the end result is, like, you know, people like it, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'm reasonably happy with that solution. Yeah. <laughs> but I can get on my high horse about the importance of still life or the underratedness of it as a subject compared to, you know, well, obviously landscape or uh, to some degree figurative art or anything else. I mean, it is, it's, the, it's the one subject where we're all, you know, taught... You know, in school, it's where you start, you know, often. And, um, you know, and then it's sort of forgotten. Or it's, uh, and I, I, that, that I have problems with those sorts of mythologies, I suppose. Because I think there's a lot that can be said about still lifes. Um, even though these are the, the subjects of everyday things. I've gone to a bigger brush, which I felt I should do because you were all watching. Um, I, I think usually in my studio, uh, in the same way as I can now use sort of, uh, I'll use rounds and make them look like I've used flats or whatever else, you know, I'm also going to invariably use a smaller brush now and make it look like I've done it with a bigger brush. Um, but I have to be on my best behavior in, uh, in workshops and not do that, but I, I'm willing to own up to the, we've all got our own, uh, as we, yeah, so you can't talk and paint, so something like that, and, uh, which would be quite nice, so this, this isn't in the color plan, but this is a, uh, a sort of feeling I have that if I had a little bit of a light patch over here, um, that goes behind this the dark foliage. I think that that's quite... Now you, there's a lot of, um, as well, you know, most artists throw, you, you put your lightest light and your darkest dark where you want your focal point to be. That's standard painting rule. So wherever your focal point is, you make sure that there's the biggest amount of pop. And I'm more interested as an artist is in a, a path that your eye will follow through a painting. So I'm looking for a, um, a, a route around that, and I'm not interested in one focal point. So by doing this at the moment, I will have created 
that focal point. But there'll be other devices within the painting that will take us in other places. So we're not going to start, by the time I'm done, we will not be drawn to this and only here. Um, we'll, go, we'll go to other places within the painting. Um, but right now, I'm putting a, a very light color next to the dark. So I, again, it's this idea of um, in the larger open areas, you know, yeah, you use a bigger brush, and you're also looking for sort of possibly more exciting, dynamic brush strokes. I don't, I'm not an artist to hide my brush work. I want people to see my brush work, um, and uh, so I'll go in and make sure that they can, you know, um, and that's going to give you, you know, if you feel like it's a very fluid, loose painting over here then you're going to give me a little more latitude and think I've painted this area over here very fluidly and lat laterally. It's, it's all about sort of creating that sort of ambience, I suppose. Of, um, so, so some messy painting over here is, is what it's all about. You know. um, and also textually there, I don't know if that will pick up for you in the audience, but here there's more texture. Here there's texture because I'm on a bigger brush and I'm being a little more sloppy with my, the way I'm applying paint. So I'll be trying to balance some of that too. So I'll have to make sure, you know, there's some thick stuff over here and then there's also some here, you know. And ultimately that'll all sort of sit quite nicely. Again, it'll feel like texturally balancing across the work. Um, I'm sure we'll cover that kind of thing over the next few days. Sorry. Someone's trying to talk to me. Perhaps they're on YouTube. Saying, please stop. <laughs> <laughs> so bored. <laughs> you told me. There's a thousand people on YouTube. Uh, a thousand. Yeah. No, you, you're being sarcastic? Yeah. I yeah, there's five. <laughs> five people. It's more than five and less than a thousand. Yeah. More than five and less than a thousand. That's right. <laughs> but they're with us. But we're not telling you. <laughs> yeah. And Neil Young is one of them. Neil oh, Young. <laughs> He's far too busy, far too busy playing music. Which spot? I'll fill it in. Right there, that one. That one? Yeah, okay, I got it. Yeah, no, definitely. This is a this is um, painting by committee, isn't it? <laughs> true by true management style. You know, you can give me your suggestions, and I'll certainly take them all on board. You know, just I just won't necessarily do them all. I missed so that something else down here. Yeah. Certainly moved a bit.
only you two can see this and no one else can see what I'm doing. That's why they're all leaving. We're done. Did you typically okay. buy your flowers from the same vendor? Like you go to Trader Joe's and buy your flowers? I'm thinking I should organize a discount. Right? I keep coming in here to buy your flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, no, um, I, I don't. Um, but in the same way I said I don't care about, a lot, I have gone to like Whole Foods mm -hmm. and that's, you know, Whole Paycheck, you know, it's sort right. of so I buy, and buying all the groceries and stuff from there has probably doubled my bill. But they do have a nice set of flowers, you see. So that sometimes I've ended up just going there just because I get that one. So, yeah. So no, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I went, I bought the, 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 the things for the workshop. And I went the two, two, I went to Lucky and then I went to Safeway because I didn't have quite enough in Lucky in my mind. And then I went to Safeway and should have gone there. That was much better, right? But, oh well. So they, so that's, um, yeah. And I do have a few um, 10 flowers in my studio too that I've used as over the years, occasionally I need a certain thing. I have sort of some of that generic foliage, uh -huh. which is really good for sticking inside a, a, you know, a bouquet to jazz it up a bit. And you'll notice, I mean, if, if anyone's a professional flower arranger here, that part of that ethos as well, I would argue, within my arrangements is they're not always traditional bouquets or really right. nice bouquets. And equally, we are not really interested in painting like half-dead flowers. Um, so there's some sort of area in the middle, and it's, it's possibly, um, you know, uh, you know, then it's it's just kind of how it turned out, I suppose, you know. Uh, so I've made my, I've made my first mistake that I'm going to erase. Now. It's the curse of a big brush. <laughs> just a bit of paper towel. Oh, I see. A bit of paper towel. And do it fast if it's acrylic paint, right? Uh, what brush was it? Is that just water in one of the classes? This is water, because acrylic, yeah, acrylic's water based, so it's just water. I don't use any mediums like thickening or um, increasing the life and dry, drying times or any of those. The only one I use is a little bit of glaze medium because that's the absolutely the only way you can do it with. Um, I'm not really not sure about this. Can you do something about pineapple? What about the pineapple? Do it. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> you mean to finish that? You'd like me to do that? Do something with the pineapple. Okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, is, is the, pine, the pineapples of interest to you? Okay. It looks like a brain. Yeah. Well, it'll, 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 it can look like a brain when I'm finished. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go home and dream about it tonight. All right, all right. You're right, it's high time. High time. Yes, yeah. High time. Some attention. Okay, pineapples must be painted with a smaller brush. <laughs> That's my mandate for today. Never attempt a pineapple with a big brush. <laughs> Did you ever get so involved that you pick up your brush and you're water? Right? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And it, well, I, though, you know, it's more cups of tea with me. But yeah, I do because I, the, in my studio at home, they are at different levels, but I do occasionally still do it. I don't. Always drink it. Depends how desperate I am. Okay, so pineapple color. This uh, palette is getting kind of messy. Uh, at home in my studio, I have like something that's probably three times bigger than this, and I, I'll work my way along it. And then as it dries off on one end, I'll scrape it off. And that makes it sound very careful and regimented. And it's not quite 
so structured as I made it sound, but that's the gist. Um, now, I quite like with a pineapple to still show some of this red underpainting. So I'll leave lots of little places. And some of that, what you're really looking for are those, are they hexagonal or octagonal, pentagonal little shapes that you get on every um, thing. And I'll, so you can see me basically drawing around those, but I'll also leave those spaces between them. And as I work on, on the pineapple, that's what I'm really striving to keep is the illusion of those shapes in places. Um, and there will be a little bit of lost and found that I'll consciously remove that so that it's not one rigid crisscross the whole way. Um, and I'd like to get a little more kind of green here in there just to make it a bit more exciting. those sorts of colors. Sorry, this was more detail work, so it involved me being over here again. ugly at the moment, but we'll hopefully fix that. So I've, I've kind of touched on sort of the darks and the lights at the moment, and I'm obviously going to be you know, I, I tell you, I often will break things sort of psychologically into those three, th uh, three you know, sort of the, a, a light and the dark and then something in between. And that's kind of what I'm working towards here. Um, and sometimes that the color in the middle is a bit of push and pull, and sometimes it's... Um, uh, it's, it's just blending those two tones together. In this case, uh, I'm, I'm sort of attempting to find a fairly pleasing sort of warm hue, um, which is probably something close to that. Um, okay, so how often do you <laughs> just get too carried away and you wind up with mud and you have to kind of go over it a little bit after it dries with white? Do you ever do it? Oh, yeah, I think we all do it occasionally, um, as as little as possible. I don't, you know, it, it does happen. I, you know, I, I have an artist friend of mine who literally paints very slowly and methodically and never goes back, you know, never goes over anything he does. He c so every stroke is a commitment. And I can't live like that. You know, I have to go back and tweak and adjust and... Um, and I don't, it doesn't mean I enhance and change everything, but there's definitely, and uh, there's definitely areas that I want to modify. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's all about that sort of style and the type of marks. Because I am attempting to do fairly large and generous strokes and fairly easy and fluid ones, that means I need to, I would argue, move at a certain speed and be fairly confident in how I approach and things. And, and I would say that then, well, then I'm not always going to, you know, end up with things quite the way I thought, and so I'm going to want to adjust sometimes, right? Um, and so there's my there's my two cents. But there might be an argument made for well, if you were better at mixing color in the first place, you wouldn't have to. 
go back. Um, I'm not even going to get into which of those two is the right answer. But how's that looking from a distance? Does it look like a pineapple? Doesn't look like a brain. Doesn't look like a brain. <laughs> yes, we've succeeded. A fruity brain. What kind of border are you hanging on? So this is like sort of MDF -y type type stuff. Um, I, I'll even sometimes buy those panels uh, like a gesso board, you know. Um, but then I never leave it alone. I will. I'll come and um, add. Uh, my own coats of gesso over the top. I'll sand them. I'll I'll attack them before I even begin. You know. Uh, do you gesso on both sides? I do because if you don't, you'll get curve. Um, so you're supposed to keep that balanced, right? Yeah. Um, I'll do. Generally, I'll do if it's a larger panel, and I buy my own wood sometimes <laughs> and sand that and gesso it. So I'll do two thick coats on both sides. And then I'll do a, sometimes a third, what I'll call textual coat on the top. And then I'll go on the back and I'll do like a big sort of stripe and cross hatching to, to counteract that. Yeah. Um, uh, in the case of the gesso board, it's already arrived with coats of thin gesso on it. Yeah. So I'll generally only add one on the, the side that's supposed to be ready. And depends how big it is. But if it's this sort of size, I'll probably do two on the back. Um, they all get ultimately get framed, but I, with those sort of, as long as you keep your numbers pretty close to balanced, it's yeah. not going to curve. Um, take it from again, someone who used to have a lot more curvy paintings out there because I wasn't always yeah. balancing it quite so well. And the sanding um, isn't by texture for the thing that's thick. Uh, so I like, so I want, I, I'm not, so I don't paint very many canvases over wood or panel. And that's because I don't like the um, regularity of canvas too. So in this, so in the case of the moment you start applying thick gesso, you are then getting brush marks um, instead of any kind of regularity. And the brush marks look can sometimes look like final painting. So if you do very thin washes, it'll actually look like you've done lots of really interesting brush work when in actual fact you did lots of really interesting gessoing. Now I don't often paint that thin or whatever really. But that's the mindset that, again, I'm coming from. Because even when I was doing the watercolor, I was interested in having a good ground, an interesting ground uh, underneath. And so that's, it's all sort of built up from those sorts of, pardon? Cheating. It's cheat, cheating, no, no, because it's the end result is built on that, right? So I mean, I'm trying to make my, do it, achieve it in the easiest way, or the best way, I suppose. Um, it's, it's, yeah, there's other ways to do it, yeah, you know. But you could make the same argument then that painting with a large brush is cheating over using a tiny brush with lots and lots of strokes, right? Yeah, so it's not, it's not, it's just making your life easier. Um. When you're pretending you're doing one when you're doing the other, then. <laughs> yeah. Then then, like so then I am cheating, aren't I? Because I do, <laughs> I'm doing that small brush painting, but making it look like a big brush is cheating. Maybe that's the case. <laughs> cool. Well, all right. You have an audience in us. I, I do. I'm, I, <laughs> yeah, I think that's very made of. Made of. in all things, right? So you're looking for um, color balance across the painting or unification across the painting. Mm -hmm. You're looking for, um, you're looking for, it's, it's all about composition type issues. You're looking for basically a pleasing um, uh, symmetry within the work or, or direction or all of those sorts of arguments. And the same can be true of types of strokes as well as how thick they've been, you know, the paint's been put on. So, you know, I was saying up here, you know, I had that, you know, heavy, you could see the, the brushwork. 
So I felt like you're going to want to see the brushwork in other places. If this was the only place you could really see the brushwork, mm -hmm. it's going to feel odd. Mm -hmm. So you want to make some balance and make some unity across them. Yeah. Now, it's the same with composition. Um, to make it interesting, you, would have, you wouldn't have the same shape of object across. You'd have one yeah. bigger, one smaller one. And it's the same with this. The small area of very t texture over here, a bigger area of texture over here, a smaller one again. You know, it's creating that sort of a, a randomness which creates interesting or a sort of a path or a direction. And the same could be true of color or texture or, you know, um, that's what you're striving for. And as long as you do it, as long as you get close and you get all enough of it close, then you end up with a good painting. So that, like, will I do the texture happening perfect? Maybe not. But will I, in concert with doing an okay job at that, get good colour and good composition and enough of these other things are all good? I'll, I'll end up with a good painting. <laughs> Keep going. Work on that chair. Chair. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, sorry. Hold that chair. Yeah. Well, the, the chair color wise is almost what's what's going to keep key it in. Because um, I've got uh, a little bit of blue down here, ultimately, which is balancing the chair or reaction. When you, it's a tone you need to get right. So if I paint it too, if it's too dark, too strong, you know, it's then going to draw our eye, especially at this stage, because the reason the chair at that um, degree of brightness in the color plan works is because this is very dark, and so and that's not dark enough yet, probably, to really make it sing. I would say I could make the chair a little lighter. <laughs> well, I think there's not everyone here, I think I'm right in saying, not everyone remaining is, is in the workshop, so I'm not going to bore them yeah. with telling what yeah, we're doing. So, but don't, don't worry, it'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited. I think there'll be some element of me demonstrating something, for, partly for the people who weren't here. Um, so acrylic paint dries fast, right. you know, and I painted all of everything I came with tonight when you saw it at the beginning that had been done and two so days you, ago. you get that effect of that light, lighter. The light through is because of the moment is a little transparent. Um, but again, I'm going to be looking for consistency with the rest of the paint. And so. But then there's also this, where do we want the focus to be? So if I made this very transparent and interesting, where our eye is going to be looking in the wrong place. So that's the, I really don't want us ending up over looking at the chair for any length of time. But I do want the chair to balance with things. And the chair at the moment is, is basically adding a balance with this very heavy, some flower. It's a dark set of flowers. It's a big, really, so a dark chair over here, those two are bookending or pillars. Are you going to darken the flowers more though? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm going to do, well, I'm going to do more work in there. And that'll have a saturating sort of. All right. More of a contrast there. Yeah. Um, and they're not, you know, this was sort of, this was sort of the early start to, to it, I would say. So there's, um, there's some more mid tones going to go into the foliage, and I wouldn't. And it is the kind of thing that I might go. That's not quite dark enough. And again, I might just do a little bit of glazing in the shadowy areas just to push it down. It's very bit. pleasing right now. It I is. can see why you would want to darken the sh some of the shadows more. I don't know if I'd want it as dark as the chair. Right. Well, and the, the chair needs. Yeah, I don't want to go too dark with 
Okay, so for this turn I'm putting it here. Is at risk of being too dark, but it's, but I, you know, it's some people are very good at being able to see those sort of tonal nuances, and I'm, I'm never quite sure how good I am at that. <laughs> I think there's always, I think probably there's room for improvement. You know. Can you use a longer brush and sit back here with me? I know. Yeah. Well, you, I, you can just tell me, but, I, but then okay. if I find out you're wrong. <laughs> no, you say it. Let me do it. <laughs> See eye to eye at the end of the day, too. So that's, um, so even though telling you I never do too many color mixes, that's that was more than two. See this color and I've actually mixed a whole bunch of colors and I've got cerulean blue in it. It should have just come straight out of the tube. I don't see much difference in that color wise. Not to worry. Um, and then I'm going to do this. I think that the, the original color concept has this dark. This is like a, you know, there's, there's a, uh, what's it called, so it's basket weaving sort of seat here, and um, this is the lighter wood around the edge, and when I do the, in here, I would do it dark grain, and that'll create some nice sort of contrasts. Start looking from back there. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then it's going to be a little rich. But, um, well, when you darken in the face, it's going to be fine. Exactly. Exactly. Good point. <laughs> so when you finish this, will this go to um, the gallery in Cornwall? Or I don't know where this will go at this stage. I have. I'm, I'm, there's a lot of um, effort at the moment going into my, my show in the summer in Santa Fe. And I, I, you know, I don't have enough paintings for that yet. So it, it may end up there. Um, I don't like to sort of really know until it's finished and um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it may end up going horribly wrong and you know, going in the trash can. Doing all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, also, you know, there's this sort of um, what your what you want the person to look at. I said there's not an area of focus, but there are things I don't where I don't really want the person spending too much time. And this chair is one of them. So I don't want to paint it too carefully. Because again, if there's too much detail in there, maybe they're going to look at the chair compared to other elements. Um, and so a little sort of clumsily painted and s sort of slightly less saturated colours is a good thing to become less appealing when we're going to have, you know, stronger colours and more powerful um, things in here. So I, but I'm leaving little bits as ever of the red to shine through because that's going to give me some balance, you know. The reds are going to sit nicely with the other reds in the painting, but they're also going to keep this rhythm of underpainting that I'm leaving throughout. And as I progress and as I go back, you know, I haven't finished this drape yet, but when I go in there, I'll slowly be removing more and more of those um, until hopefully there's the right number. So when does it all end? You're probably exhausted. Was there a time? <laughs> I guess it was can you spot? Can yeah. you spot? <laughs> I'm <laughs> get off. This is I'm it. feeling. I'm feeling done. <laughs> Got a big day tomorrow. Oh, that looks. You know, that added color looks. Yeah, yeah. Did it. Looks great. Yeah. 
Really Four good. more, yes. 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 <laughs> well, we'll see. I think it's, I think it's, see, I think, <laughs> personally, I think that it's beginning to wane a little bit. That's, that's the How do you know when you're done with the painting? <laughs> <laughs> good question. You mean like, just in general, rather than this specific one? I, you know, like I'm sort of saying, I was sort of hinting at, are we done? Because I was feeling like my paint, that, that my care is deteriorating a little bit. I think, I think I've, I've stepped down a notch there with that chair, or bits of that chair. And so um, that's a sign to step away and have a cup of tea or something, or a bottle of whiskey. Can I have a tea? The, um, yeah, I bought a whiskey. But the, but the other, like, how you know they're done, I used to have a, it used to be really easy. Like, like, you know, I've been doing full-time painting for, you know, like 12 years or something now. Before that was other art things. But within that period, like, I used to stop and be done and happy. And more and more in recent years, that growth of paintings that are finished but not quite finished mm -hmm. has grown in recent years exponentially and now I, I, it's not so clear to me when something's finished and I get things back sometimes from shows and I think you know what and I'll take it out of the frame and I'll strip off the varnish which is a really annoying job wow. and I'll do that enough just because I want to change some aspect of that wow. painting <laughs> and I'll do that and then I'll re put it all on out it goes again and so you know, I feel I feel that that's an area that I've now fallen into, possibly another phase of my art yeah, career. Yeah. Well, Stripping varnish. Well, I always think they were always better, but then that's just all about your current. Like I was really happy with that painting before, and now I'm really happy with it again. Mm -hmm. I've just given it a change. I've just changed it. It's like it's like you know, you bring your doll home and you put a new set of clothes on and you send it out. Yeah. That's a terrible yeah. analogy. I don't have <laughs> dolls. I don't play with dolls. YouTube. I, uh, <laughs> no, but you know, um, that's the, whatever the example, you know, it's, it really is just that kind of, I think you've got a little tired of it and you're, some of your tastes have changed in some nuanced light way mm -hmm. and I'll readdress it. But, but I have ones around the studio that I will set aside, need to set aside because I think they're finished but there's something not quite here. Yeah. And that is the wor that's the worry. Just like one, taking that's... a photo of it and putting it on. Oh, I um, I so I will. I always work sign work. my work in the last sort of twenty percent before the painting is finished because I see the signature as part of the painting, but I also sign it because I know I'm getting close and I'm almost there and it's sort of all, and then I'm not quite agreed to being done. And so so um, and then you never quite know when you're there. And I'll photograph it and I'll add it to my files as a finished painting. And often that's not finished, and I revisit it, and that's another annoying step because it takes time to photograph it and document it, and, and then you have to do it all again because you changed it. But I think that's now become all part of that uh, setup. You know, it's it's something I have to go through to for my neurosis and my sanity. Yeah. So do you varnish all your paintings? Yeah, absolutely. What do you use? Um, so I, it's a uh, golden M. It's a golden varnish, it's good for acrylic and oil. It's a gloss varnish, and I dilute it with their approved dilution, which isn't mineral spirits, because you add a mineral spirit to their mixture. MPV, I think it's called. It's nasty stuff. I use the golden mineral spirit one, and okay. it's made by Golden, and it, it works for both. <laughs> yeah. it'll, it'll come off with regular old industrial grade mineral spirits. And I, I used to use. Yeah, it stinks uh, terrible. Yeah, they all do, don't they? I used to use this really nice one, I can't even remember the brand now, because I started in Scotland, and I used to use a, a varnish there that was from Holland, and it was wonderful stuff, and you can't get it in America, no. I don't know why. So now that's, this is, I've gone through a few now, I'm reasonably happy with what I'm using. Well good. Well as far as uh, finishing points, let's finish up tonight's uh, demo uh, with a thanks to you for, for doing this, and Thank we'll continue you. on. This will. Uh, this is our first uh, live YouTube uh, thing. We've been doing these for five years, uh, demo nights.
let you know in the morning. But we'll be here at 8.30, uh, and we'll get started close to 9, so come in and bring your things in, and if you need a hand, uh, I'll, I'll come down and, and, and help bring things up. So um, it's, it's 8 o'clock, and we've got a big day tomorrow. So. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions? Thank you. All right. Thanks. Are you going to have a raffle for your painting? <laughs> a raffle? No, but the, ra the painting is...